I have to say, I really love technology. Whether that's using the iPad and building code to do a lot of cool things or using technology to make your drinks. But regardless, the experience is awesome. Today I'm going to show you how you can go ahead and install VS Code on your iPad and get the full desktop experience using your iPad. So it's very simple. You put the icon on your desktop, you click it, it's going to go ahead and load it. You put in your password, hit submit. You are now logged in to VS Code Server running on your iPad. And I've actually built this entire script that you're seeing here. And I'll link something similar in the description where I'll run every now and then and check stock for me. Now this VS Code Server is actually running off of my Raspberry Pi. And I've built a PWA application for the iPad so that you can actually go ahead and get that full desktop experience. So if you want to learn how to make this, stick around. I'm going to show you step by step. Okay, so first let's go ahead and exit out of this and we're going to go and open up an application called ISH. Now ISH is what I use basically to do all of my Linux commands on the iPad. It's a free application. Check it out on the App Store. I'm also going to put a link up in the corner and in the description where I walk you through how to set up ISH on your iPad. So let's clear this out. Okay, so first we're going to go ahead and authenticate into our Pi. So we're going to SSH into the Raspberry Pi. And then we're going to say yes to fingerprinting. And then finally, we're going to put in our password. Now, just for context, I'm using a Raspberry Pi 4 with the 4 gigabyte RAM. Now, the other thing we need to do is we need to make sure we have the right version of Node. So the Raspberry Pi 4 gets shipped with version 10, and we need at least version 12 for this to work. So I'm going to go ahead and install a helper file that's going to allow me to go and manage the versions of my Node. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and clear this out and then type in sudo n stable. Now that's going to get me the most stable version of Node as of this recording, which is version 14. So let's clear this out and now we're going to go back and check our Node version. And we're good. We have Node version 14. Okay, so next we're going to go ahead and execute that script. And sorry that went a little bit fast, but if you look on the top, it's a, it's a curl command. And I'll put that in the description. And what that does is it automates the process end to end for you to go ahead and install code server. And again, code server is an implementation of VS code. All right, now here you're going to run this inflection point where your natural tendency is going to is going to be to exit this cuz you see these errors here. Don't do that. Just let it run its course. It's actually trying to find some other packages when these errors do pop up and what you'll notice is if you let it run, it's going to go ahead and locate all the packages that it needs. Now this process is very lengthy. It probably takes end to end to run for about 10 to 15 minutes for this actual sudo command. So run it, step back, grab a coffee, and then come back. All right, so now after that runs, which was there for about 10 minutes, I just cut out that part of the video. It's gonna go ahead and search the rest of the dependencies, but I'm gonna let it run because I want you to see exactly what's happening so that you can compare and make sure that you have a similar experience with your Raspberry Pi. And now, you know, I should also say that as I say this is run, running on a Raspberry Pi, in reality, you can run this on a Linux server. You can run this um, in Google Cloud, and you can use things like tensor units to really uh, boost up the, the, the speed in the background if you're doing machine learning. You can put this in DigitalOcean and access this um, externally as well. So you can really put this anywhere, but I think using a Raspberry Pi is probably the easiest way to show you. Okay, so actually now this is done running. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear this out. So the next thing I wanna go ahead and see is check out the actual hostname address. And I just realized I should be using capital I, not small i, because capital I is going to give me the local address of the Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to type in hostname TAC capital I, and that's going to give me the IP address for the Raspberry Pi itself. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and run code server to make sure that it actually installed correctly. To do that, you just type in code hyphen server. And this is exactly what we want to see. This tells me that it's actually working. And we're not serving this over HTTPS because this is over your local server. Now, there are ways to do that with self-signed certificates, but we're not going to go there today. What we are going to do is we're going to go ahead and edit that config file. And within that config file, the only thing we're really going to touch and change is the password. Everything else we'll leave as is. So I'm just going to go ahead and edit this password. And just for simplicity's sake, we'll make it something very easy for now. Just say make it hello123. And I changed my mind. Let's also go up here and change this bind address to 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 .0 
because I'm not going to be using a reverse proxy like Nginx. We're just going to be serving this on our host. So any basically any uh, device on the network is going to be able to go ahead and access it. So let's go ahead and run code server again. And we see that it's actually running on 0, 0.0. So now let's go ahead and go to that website. So it's dot 201 and then the port was 8081. I changed it to for now. Um, and when you go ahead and run code server and you put in the password, hello, one, two, three, we hit submit. Now this may take a little bit of time on the first run because it's trying to initialize everything in the back end. What I found is that when I ran it the second or third time, it ran pretty quick. So there you go. You have an instance of code server. It's just telling you that it's not going to be served over HTTPS. Um, but outside of that, you have a working instance of code server, which is awesome. Let's just go ahead and check out some of the things. You can go to your directory and open a folder if you wanted. And again, this is running the latest version, which is 3.9 as of this recording. I was like using the dark theme. So we're going to go ahead and change that over. And the settings, as you can see, get applied automatically. And now it goes into dark mode, which is awesome. Okay, let's go back for a second to the Pi. There's a little bit more work to do. So what I want to do is I want to find the execution path, which is right there. And that's going to be important because we're going to create a service file. And let me just fix this and add in system there. You're going to create this service file and you're going to copy and paste this code. Now I will have this on GitHub as well. You can go ahead and download this code um, and put it and use it for your Raspberry Pi. And as you can see under the X path, that's basically the execution that I use or the execution path that I used. So we're going to go ahead and start this system file. And all this does is that it runs a process in the background so you don't have to start code server every single time on your own. And once you've done this, we're going to go back and check the status to make sure that it's running properly, which it is. And that's awesome. And now we're going to enable it because I want to make sure that every time on reboot, this actually runs on its own so you don't have to go back and run it every single time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and write in sudo system ctl enable code server. And again, that's going to do that in the background for you. It's going to create a symbolic link and now we're good to go. So I always like to just go ahead and finish this off with a reboot. So we just hit sudo reboot. And now we're just going to go ahead and run this back again to make sure that the actual status shows that code server is running fine. So let's go ahead and run this. And right off the bat, I see an issue and that's something that I did. Sorry. And that is, I forgot to change the bind address in the actual service file. So let's go back and open the service file. And we're just going to go ahead and change that bind address again, back to 0.0.0. .0 .0. And again, because I'm not using a reverse proxy, I have to do this. Um, if you are using a reverse proxy, you're fine, uh, especially if you're using like a pie hole or something like that, and you can go ahead and set up your local DNS. But outside of that, I can't really do that here. So I just changed the bind address back to there. And I'm going to go ahead and restart this code server. It's going to go ahead and tell me that I need to go and reload the daemon, which is fine. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Okay, now once that's done, let's go back and look at our status. And now I'm running out of bind address of 0.0.0.0, which is exactly what I want. Now that just means any device on your server can go to the local IP address of the Raspberry Pi, which in, in this case is .201. And we'll change it back to port 8080 because that's what we have in our service file. And we go ahead and back and rerun this. And you're going to see how much more quicker this is. So this runs. I've got to go back and reset my settings again. So first things first for me. I have to go back in and change this back to dark mode because I just can't work in this kind of an environment. It's too stressful. So here we go. We change it back to dark theme. All gets saved. And now in the future, when I run this, it's going to be fine. It's going to all be in dark mode. Now I'm going to go and run this in our private window. And I'm going to try to create a PWA, which is basically a progressive web app. And that allows you to go ahead and add this to your home screen. So as you can see, it's called code server. I'm going to just change it to VS code. Now it's got, it's on my desktop or it's on my iPad, which is great. What I don't like is that icon. So I actually want to have the traditional VS code icon. So we're going to switch that in a second, but I just want to show you the beauty of this now is it's full screen. So no longer do I have a browser uh, window or within, you know, where I can go ahead and put in uh, a URL or something. It's actually a full screen experience. And that's what I love about this. All right, so let's go ahead and now take care of that icon because man, that bothers me. 
So I'm going to open an application that I have. It's called Textastic. I use it every now and then for coding, but really I like the fact that it has this cool FTP capability. Now this is the icon I want to use. I want to be able to have this on my desktop because that is the traditional VS Code logo and that's what really what I want to use. And that's what we're going to go ahead and change our desktop icon to. So in order for me to do this, I need to go ahead and open up the SFTP access, basically SSH into this uh, server that we built. So I'm just going to give it a name for now. I'll go ahead and log in with the IP address that we've been using, put in the username and put in the password. And then now we're done. I'm going to go, go ahead and open this and I'm not going to save this directly into the VS code file yet, just because of permissioning. I'm just going to go ahead and upload this into my, into my documents uh, folder for now or downloads folder, I should say for now, and just throw it in there. And we're going to go ahead and move it within the actual Linux commands and use a pseudo command to do it. It's just a lot easier. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and find that directory and you see that the two files are sitting in the downloads and that's those two VS code files. And again, these will be available on my GitHub so you can go ahead and just download them from there. Okay, so now this took me a little bit of time, but I'm going to save you guys the effort here to find the actual location of where this stuff is still supposed to get moved into for this to work with VS code server. So I'm going to be going ahead and seeding into a whole bunch of directories, but just give me a second. I'm going to print the working directory and that's what you should be using at the end of the day. So let's go ahead and type in PWD. And that is a directory that you need to use. So go ahead and CD into that directory over there. Once you've done that, we're going to go into browser. Then finally go into media. And this is the actual directory where all of those files sit today. But I want to grab that path over there because that path is what I'm going to use to move my documents over. And you'll see that in a second. So let's go back into our downloads. And you see those two files. So I'm going to type in sudo mv for move. And I'm going to type in vs star. That basically means that I'm going to move any file that starts with vs and then anything after that basically into that directory that we uh, copied the path to. So now if I go back into that path, into the VS code path, I should say, you'll see under media. Now I have those two files sitting there, which is exactly what I want. And now we're just going to go back and now I'm going to open the pages folder. And in pages, you're going to see the login.html, which is going to go into the login.html. And we're going to go ahead and change two lines, which are right here. And those are basically your PWA icons that it's supposed to display. So we're going to type in the VS code ones that we actually added. Now let's clear this out and now we're going to go ahead and see that when I actually try to save it, now it actually defaults to the right icon that I want. So I can call this whatever I want. So I'm just going to go ahead and back this out, call this VS code server hit add. And as you can see, it gets added to my desktop and now I can basically call this anything and it's a full instance of VS code running off of my Raspberry Pi. Now this is pretty awesome. And the benefit of this is I can install whatever I want that you'd be able to install in a general VS Code server. You can install on this. Just keep in mind that you're going to be constrained by the actual capacity of the Raspberry Pi. But outside of that, you know, the fact that you can do this is awesome and now you can code on your iPad. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing and I will see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye bye.